Welcome gardeners. I'm glad to be back a little bit hoarse, but I'm ready to talk about plants. And so we're glad that you have joined us. We've got a great show today and wait till you see who's here. But first I'll introduce myself. I'm Diane Noland and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois. So my area would be cut flowers and perennials. Now, our first panelist is on the far side here and this is Dr. Stephen Still. Hi, Steve. Good evening, everyone. I'm Steve Still, as mentioned, and I'm from Ohio right now. I'm native born in Illinois, but I'm an emeritus professor from Ohio State University and also the executive director of the Perennial Plant Association. So that means I like perennials. Uh, tonight, I want to do a show and tell on Baptisia australis, which is one of our native plants. And we have in the industry and uh, the whole ecological thing, let's plant native plants. And this is a perfect one that we might utilize. Common name, uh, false indigo, blue wild indigo, different type of things. It's a great uh, plant. You can see it uh, now. Uh, blue flowers, typically May and June. Probably it's not quite in flower here yet, but about four feet tall, four feet wide. One great thing about it, low maintenance. If, after you get that baby established, it's there mm -hmm. for a long time. So you don't have to worry about it being an invasive or anything. And it's just a real super uh, plant. So since it is native, uh, then it's going to do very well in central Illinois and the surrounding because it's native to the prairies of this area. It is a beautiful plant. Very nice. Well, thank you, Steve. And now next is Jennifer Fishburn. Hi, Jennifer. Good evening. Hello. I'm Jennifer Fishburn. I'm a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension covering Logan, Menard, and Sagamon counties. Um, I work a lot with our volunteers, both master gardeners and master naturalists know a little bit a lot or excuse me a little <laughs> bit about everything but um, really like to talk about vegetables and mm -hmm. herbs um, and tonight I brought with me a uh, rosy basil um, and a basil is a very uh, common herb but this particular uh, cultivar is one that tends to stay a little more true to the purple gets about 18 inches tall great as a decorative plant accent plant in a container um, also great for the culinary herb garden as it can be used um, in cooking and it is rosy. Rosy. R-O-S-I-E. I-E. Rosy. Oh, how cute. I haven't grown that one yet, and I really do like the purple one. It's ones. very nice. Very good. Thank you, Jennifer. And now next to Jennifer is the preening David Robson. Yes, I mean, yes, David Robson yes, is next. Diane, thank you. I couldn't resist. Sorry. Hi, I'm David <laughs> Robson. I'm a horticulture and pesticide safety specialist with the University of Illinois. I know a little bit about, like Jennifer, a lot of things, mainly tree shrubs, uh, lawn care, lawn. that's basically, and then the diseases, the insects and weeds. And my actually show and tell is preen, and it's, I'm not encouraging or disparaging it. I, I'm bringing it here for the simple fact that there are two preens out on the market, and when somebody says, ooh, I use preen to control weeds as a pre-emergence, and it's a weed uh, control for pre-emergence weed, you need to always read the label carefully. One of these, this one right here with my hand, is actually an organic form, and the other one here is an inorganic form. Uh, it, the active ingredient is trifluralin, which basically is treflan or something along that line. But they're not used in the same method, and if somebody's a big organic gardener, then you may want to look to make sure you get the organic form as opposed to the inorganic form. Uh, if you pick up both, they are not used the same way, so always make sure you read and follow the directions on the label so you know exactly how the product is to be used. And that brings us to the question uh, somebody wanted to know about if any of these project products, if they put on, are going to hurt their rabbits. And I guess you could talk about any animal. And of course, you know, some of us are thinking, okay, if it hurts the rabbits, uh, well, we won't are they pet rabbits that. or are they rabbits I in don't know. It's rabbits living in their yard. And of oh. course, we all are saying, oh my gosh. And uh, fortunately, I have neighborhood cats that run around, and that's the end of those rabbits for me. Oh, look at those rabbits. Um, but <laughs> you have to read and follow the directions on the label. Sometimes uh, some of the products may hurt animals. The label will usually tell you make sure that you don't have animals out on that. Uh, area until the spray is dried, the dust is settled, whatever the label says. Follow that direction, whether it's cats, dogs. If for some reason you like Peter Cottontail or Fluffy <laughs> and you don't mind them 
in your yard, you know, you're probably going to go with something more organic, like the corn gluten that's in this form. It's mm -hmm. not going to harm anything. Uh, it may not even harm the weeds if you put it on after the weeds are already up, too. Yeah, there is that. I know. Okay, well, thank you, David. Very good. Well, we're going to go to our video mail next on lawns. Hello, I'm calling from Urbana, and as you can see, I have a lot of ground that apparently does not grow due to the fact that there are so many trees in the yard. As you can see, it's quite shady, and that the ground seems to be not conducive to growing a full lawn. So my question to you is, what can I do to bring grass back to my yard? Thank you. Well, yes, that was uh, me since I like turf grass. And I always tell people if they want to grow grass in deep shade, they need to go out to the woods, take their shovel and get all of the grass that they find growing in the deep shades in the woods of Illinois. Mm. And chances are they're not going to find any because most of our grasses are sun-loving grasses. Even the ones that we say like the fine fescues probably even still need a little bit of sun. With all those trees, he may have a dense root system and the grasses are just drying out too. He might consider watering more, but ultimately it comes down to the fact that if you're going to have shade and you like the shade, you're not going to have grass. But there are alternatives. And the three of us are happy to give the alternatives. Steve, do you want yes, to start? Yes, I'd like to put a plug in for uh, a lamium or the a cousin of it called lamiastrum. A uh, common name is yellow archangel. It's about 12 inches tall, variegated f foliage, and sometimes even in the uh, wintertime it might uh, stay slightly evergreen. It is invasive, so it's, you don't put it in with your other fine perennials that you might like to use, but it's a great ground cover. I use it a lot, although I curse it a lot because then it's got into my other nicer perennials, but if it's all you have underneath the trees, use that product or that plant and it's going to be a great job for you. Great. Did you want to chip in? I will chip <laughs> in. Um, the other thing you need to remember is that um, trees and anything you plant above them are going to compete for water and nutrients. So it's best if you actually not plant anything on top of the tree roots. That being said, it's difficult for a lot of people to do because the roots do spread pretty extensively. Um, so we really recommend getting mulch on there, about three to four inches deep of mulch to cover up that soil. The other thing is in, in my particular yard, um, I went with what I could find at the time, which was the cheapest, and that was vinca vine. Um, that will spread, but it's an easy controllable spread that you can pull out and the typical standby hostas. And um, you can pick both those up at any plant sale uh, coming up here in the near future. Uh, those would be both good things to use, but we really recommend trying to, to keep away from those tree trunks definitely and, and to go out as far as you can before you plant anything. And I was thinking too, in the mulch that you were mentioning, it'd be nice to have some um, spring beauties, mm -hmm. actually bring some wildflowers in, have a few trillium underneath Daffodils. there. Daffodils. Daffodils would be great. And then maybe out away from it, you could put some sweet woodruff. And if you let the plants grow in, you know, like the ground covers, then it's not so hard on the roots. So anyway, we did not really give many questions, answers about the lawn itself, and but it's, we're going to make the, going it's to. Not but the yard is going to be great if you take our <laughs> suggestions. All right. Well, thank you for your calls. And I'm going to get to line two first, and it's about poppies. Hello there. Hi. Uh, I've been told that... Uh, Poppies are not easily transplanted as established plants, digging and borrowing. Is this true? And if not, when would be the best time to do a transplant? Because the ones I'm looking at are already budded. Okay, so poppies and transplanting. We can give a couple testimonials here. I, I would think that you could still, uh, that they're not, they're relatively easy to transplant this is not the time to do it as you've indicated. So in the, the fall, uh, they could be lifted that time or obviously about th two or three weeks ago before, while they were just starting to come uh, up th through the soil. And when you transplant them, 
poppies are also really great from root cuttings. Oh. And so I've transplanted them and then ended up with two poppies <laughs> back in the spot where I transplanted them from. So you can take root cuttings and you could do that. Couldn't they do that now? I mean, or maybe after flowering might even I'd be better. I'd say after flowering, But yeah. it's only a couple inches and you just, you know, take a little bit and see that and then transplant the whole thing in fall. Okay, thank you for your question. Let's go on next to line three and it's about rhubarb. Hello. What's Hello. your question? Uh, I just put out some rhubarb last fall and I've heard that you're not supposed to harvest it for a couple of years or you can get sick from it. Is that true? Okay, we're gonna look to you, Jennifer. I, I don't, I, I, I can't say that you would get sick from it, but what you're looking to do there, that's a perennial plant. So what you're wanting that d root system to do is develop a good, strong root system. And the only way it can do that is through the leaves and photosynthesis. So it's important to let that plant develop before you harvest it. Um, so I would, I would give it at least an, a two year establishment. And that's also gonna depend on um, the, the weather that we have. If we have a weir like last year, you'll have to wait a little bit longer because it's gotta get a good, strong root system developed so it can overwinter each year. Now he mentioned um, that it would be cause problems for you to harvest. Do you think he's talking about after a frost? Well, definitely. Uh, rhubarb um, in the leaves has oxalic acid, which can, in a, fr in a frost or a freeze situation, that can go back down into the stem they, sometimes. So you, you should not ever harvest for anybody out there um, rhubarb that's been um, frosted or, or frozen in any way and pull those, pull those stalks out so you know not to eat those. Okay, very well, I good. I was going to guess that he was going to talk that his rhubarb was flowering, which is happening now, too. And when be. you find that it's starting to flower, what do you do immediately? You cut those flower stalks Nip off. It. Nip, Nip it. Nip it right away. <laughs> Nip it in the flower Absolutely. bud. Very good. Okay, there's a little primer on rhubarb. And now let's go to line four, and it's about house plants yellowing. Line four. Hello. Hi. Hey, I enjoy your program. Thank I look you. forward to it every week. But mine is, is I want to know, uh, the leaves of my plants are turning yellow. Uh, I don't know if I'm over watering or not giving enough watering, or what am I doing wrong? What type of house plants? Okay, they must have gone off, but. This is gonna be a little bit what? broad. What, over watering, <laughs> under watering, not enough humidity, uh, too mm -hmm. much light, too little light, uh, bumping them if it's touch, um, Oof. You know, lots of things can cause it, and it depends on what type of plant you're looking at. Uh, if she thinks that she's watering too much, cut back on the watering. If you don't think you're watering enough, water it. Put it in the sink and let water drain out through the sink. Let it sit there for 30 minutes, and then put it in your saucer and put it back to where you really want it. But as far as, you know, lights and everything else, it's going to be difficult. I mean, yellowing is something that happens, and then even with age. If it's the right. lower leaves, they could be yellowing with age. Some of them may want it to be going outside in a Absolutely. few weeks too. Yes, once it gets a little bit warmer. Right. Okay, so that was a difficult question, even though it sounded easy. <laughs> There's a lot of things that can cause yellowing. Okay, now we are going to go to a fun fact uh, as part of the show, so don't go away. Here we go. <laughs> Once you have dill, you have it. It seems like it sows and, and you do have it. So. And fennel too. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. And boy, the larva of um, butterflies really like both <laughs> and dill, then if you swallowtails. Have, and if you have cardinals, they like it too because the larva <laughs> likes it. Oh, and I didn't so, think of that. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. Well, now let's go back to the phone lines and we're going to talk to a person who has a question about apples. Hello there. Hello. I would like to know if there's some treatment to uh, prevent core rot in my delicious apples. What was it? Core rot. I oh, core think. rot. But I'm wondering if she meant corky core. Uh, no, it's just kind of, kind of a brown core rot. And there's no insect in the middle of it. No. Okay. Hmm. Well, a lot of times you get some of the. Um, physiological problems due to more um, 
and micronutrients mm -hmm. than anything else. And so she might want to look for a fertilizer that has boron, iron, sulfur, magnesium, manganese, um, some of those little minor elements, follow the directions, put that around the tree. Uh, that's going to be one of the things. And of course, follow a regular spray program. But it, to me, I'm lending more toward uh, micronutrient problems than anything else. But you know, if she gets a sample, sends it into the master gardeners or the plant mm -hmm. clinic or DDDI, when we finally, when it happens again, we can probably look at it. Uh, but it, and if she's not following a regular spray program, there are some diseases that probably could get inside. But if it's rotting in the middle, makes me think that there's something else going on besides a disease. Very interesting and challenging. Okay, well, thank you for that uh, question. Now, let's go back to our, um, our questions from viewers. So I'm going to start with you, Steve. Okay, I have a, a question. It is, my pin oak leaves turn yellow in the summer. Is there anything I can do about this? This is a fantastic question I could give my students all the time in, the, in plant materials. But with uh, pin oak in this area of the state and in country, really, we often have high pH soils. And so the yellowing is actually from iron chlorosis. Uh, for as treatment, uh, we can try to lower the pH of the soil. Sometimes that's done with uh, sulfur uh, type of fertilizers. Uh, or there's also trunk injections of iron chelate type of products. The difficulty is that even though you lower the pH, it always keeps coming back up because of the calcareous nature of the soil. So it is a long-term type of problem. We do have uh, controls. I would recommend that it uh, work with a, a uh, certified arborist that uh, knows the, the situation, have them come out and take a look at the, the tree and do the appropriate injection work for that. It can be controlled, but it's gonna be a continuous process for it. And it's really noticeable too. <laughs> you can almost tell where the soil changes in some parts of the state too, but very good. Thank you, that was a good question and very timely for a lot of folks. Jennifer, you are next. Um, Dave from DuPage Pant County actually has some comments um, regarding squash vine bar that bore that was on a previous show and it, he says that uh, what he has the the most success with is se using seven dust um, and 10 day in intervals um, as the plant is young um, and that is correct um, the other things that you can do if you're not wanting to use chemicals is uh, in the spring, cover the, the plants with a row cover until they begin to bloom and then remove the row cover and that will prevent the, the vine borer, which is a moth, from getting to the plant. Um, so, that, so that's a good exclusion tool. Um, other chemicals that you can use are carborel um, and other forms rather, uh, rather besides dust and also permethrin. Um, using those in pretty much weekly intervals, uh, reading the label on those um, and applying after rains um, on a regular basis to prevent the infestation. But squash vine bar is usually, once it gets in there, detrimental to the plant. Oh boy, we're already talking about it, so <laughs> look out. Thank you, Jennifer. And now David. Okay, it's the proverbial mole problem. They want to get rid of, or better yet, control a mole problem. I kind of like the idea that they say they want to control it as opposed to getting rid of it, because they don't want to kill anything. Uh, However, their home is nestled in a wooded area surrounded by beautiful farm fields. They use fake worms, pellets, but uh, there seems to be more moles. Well, first of all, a wooded area is ideal for a mole. They'll mm -hmm. go there time and time again. That's where all the insects are in the soil, so that's their natural habitat. Uh, they look at a farm field and they say, well, it's being tilled all the time. There's chemicals being put on it to control insects. So there's not going to be any food in a farm field, so they're looking at this wooded area and saying, ah, this is heaven, we're coming down to it. Um, that being said, there are mold traps. Um, she talked about fake worms and pellets. Um, they will kill. There are some repellents, and I think, uh, wasn't it Ohio State that did some repellent work with, uh, or Michigan, with uh, castor beans and mm. planting them all the way around to create sort of a, 
uh, uh, that's a lot of cats. I know. I'm thinking in a wooded area, and I can't imagine that they do well in the yeah, shade they either. Like sun, so so sun. I don't know really what you can do. It's probably from Michigan. Um, probably from Michigan instead of Ohio. <laughs> yeah, Steve. I'm sure it's that way. <laughs> but but the whole point is that trying to control moles is a continual battle. Remember, these are creatures that are trying to eat their body weight a day in order wow. to stay alive. So think about how much you weigh, Diane, and try to eat that much a day. You know, it's like 50 yeah, pounds, right? Yeah, 50, 50 pounds, pounds would be a yes, lot Yes, I eat. know. <laughs> um, but that's what the worm is doing. It's kind of like the opposite of cats. It eats all the time and very rarely sleeps, hmm. as opposed to the cat, which sleeps all the time and, you know, sleeps even more. Um, a good dog, that's another option for mole controls, but... You know, it's it's going to be difficult. They're just in a challenging spot. It, you live in a wooded area. You're living in the perfect habitat for it. In in, o in Ohio and Cincinnati, at least one time, there was a company called the Mole Man, and he mm. came out and captured your moles. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a cartoon character, <laughs> you know. It's but he would get a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Too. Okay, great. Well, let's go to a question now that's about rhubarb and ivy, and it's on line six. Hello there. Yeah. Um. The previous person kind of answered my call. Okay. Uh, but I, I don't know, how can you tell what leaves are bad on a rhubarb plant if they've been frosted or frozen? No, you'll, you'll be able to tell. It, it'll, they just collapse. They just collapse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They kind of look mushy. Um, they won't re hold their um, leaves upright. You'll, you'll be able to tell. But oh, people okay. try to salvage the stem. Yeah, and you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. Even though it, it's not collapsed, but you don't want to, it's it's not good at all. But yeah, it okay. has a wilted appearance. Right. Okay. Great. Um, my other question is, will I have an I, ivy bed and you know it's ground cover, mm -hmm. and um, it's climbing up my maple tree. Will it kill the tree? Well. Eventually, well, the ivy killed the tree. Yeah, I mean, it looks nice, and we always tell people let it go up to the first scaffold of branches, and then prune it. Uh, I never like. I mean, I got ivy, and I have euonymus growing up the tree, but as soon as it reaches that scaffold of branches, I cut it back halfway, just because I don't want it to grow yeah. out on the branches. It it will it, it eventually, and in fact, in in Oregon. Uh, uh, English ivy is a, a noxious weed, and it's a, they banned for sale mm -hmm. there because it gets into the, the trees. And, so. and the ivy would actually cover up the structure of the tree, and you wouldn't know what to plant uh, to prune. Mm -hmm. So I would think it's a little bit like kudzu; it just shades yeah, out and everything. And I really don't let it grow up any of my trees because I really like the shape and the silhouette of the tree. But you say that some people will let it go to the first scaffolding, so. And then just keep cutting it back if it grows more, and then just, it pulls off the trunk um, of the tree easily. Same as Virginia creeper. 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 I don't mm. let it grow on <laughs> anything, because I really want to see, I mean, I'll let it grow on a fence, but I don't, I don't want it to grow on a tree. So it's kind of up to you what you're willing to adjust to, I think. But eventually it will take over a tree, yes. so you've got to get it before it's too tall for you cut it at, you know, where you can go from there. All right. Well, let's go to a yucca question on line three next. Line three. Nobody's there. Okay. Well, let's go to line two, and it's about maples. Hi, line two. Yeah. My wife and I have planted several maples over the past Five to 15 years, mm -hmm. and we've lost several of them because the uh, bark starts to peel off. Sometimes it will be in a strip up and down the trunk, or other times it will actually girdle the tree, and then the tree dies. What side of the tree is the bark, when it's straight up and down, what side of the tree is it? Um, I think a lot of times it's to the south, but it, it's been all sides, mm -hmm. and often the whole trunk ends up being girdled. So we've lost maple trees from about two inches in diameter up to eight inches in diameter. Okay. Just when they're starting to get mm -hmm. that thick, up to the point where they're getting the thick bark, yeah. Okay, go for Frost it. Frost cracks. Frost crack is the, 
south side. The southeast side during the winter time, the bark is so smooth that it warms up during the winter time and then it freezes at night, warms, freezes, warms, freezes, starts cracking the bark and you will get those splits. Happens on some fruit trees, but it's thin bark trees, red maples, really notorious. And until they get their bark, it can cause severe problems. And anytime you barely skim it with a lawnmower. Mower whoa. injury, I was gonna say. And yeah. I'm not saying you did that, but mm -hmm. it's just barely skimming it for a maple. And if you plant the tree too deep, Right. Uh, and if there was something on the tree at the nursery or garden center that might have girdled it, uh, I mean, there's and lots. And maples are tough if they can get past the bark issue. Right. So. But it's all physiological. It's not mm -hmm. any insect. It's not any disease right. problem that's really doing anything. The best thing is prevention. Yep. Prevention and maybe. Tree wraps. Tree, tree wrap it. Take that wrap back off. Every oh, spring. After, yeah. Yeah. Leave it on. Yep. So. Yes, make sure you mulch around your trees when you plant them so there's no possibility of any type of lawnmower or string damage. Very good. Well, thank you so much for watching. We enjoyed being here and chatting about plants, and we will see you next time. Have a great week gardening. Bye-bye.